Hi, welcome to Culturally Determined. I'm your host, Arya Cohen-Wade, and my guest today is Connie Wang. Uh, Connie, could you introduce yourself? Hi, uh, I'm Connie Wang. I'm a senior features writer at Refinery29, and I write about fashion and clothing, sort of. <laughs> like, how I like to say it. <laughs> um, and I, uh, thanks for coming on today. I asked you on because you wrote a really interesting article. Uh, the headline is, I've written about cultural appropriation for 10 years. Here's what I got wrong. Um, and yeah, I thought it was just, there was a, there's a lot in here. We'll include the link below. I encourage people to check it out. Um, what, what made you want to write this article now? Well, I mean, thanks for having me on, first of all, to talk about this subject that I think I hate talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was actually assigned to me um, as part of the Asian Pacific American Heritage Month uh, package of stories that we were doing. And I think recently there was that um, hubbub about the high school senior who chose to wear Chi Pao dress to her, her prom. And of course, I think in any in any mass media newsroom, you're going to seize on those moments to you know try to try to do something with it. And so I was assigned um, a story unpacking why people were so angry about it, the sort of uh, discussions around it. And I was just so tired. I was pushing back really hard against my editor. I don't want to do this. I really don't want to do this. And the reasons I gave her for not wanting to do this, um, she was convinced that you know maybe the story assignment wasn't um, a good one in the first place but then told me to write what I had just told her. <laughs> so it was a, um, yeah, it was me being really antagonistic about, you know, continuing to sort of fan the flames in this way. And I just, I just didn't want to participate anymore because I saw that, you know, how people were talking about cultural appropriation in regards to this one incident was really unhelpful. Mm -hmm. So the piece is almost kind of like confessions of a former cultural appropriation call out specialist. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you talk about your, career in journalism kind of from the beginning, uh, mm -hmm. being involved in the, the debate over cultural appropriation. Um, yeah. how would, how would you define cultural appropriation to begin with? You know, this word, I don't think really exists in academia or I don't know. It's, it's a word that I think feel like was invented maybe 10 years ago, but it's taken on many different types of definition. I think at its most basic definition, it means participating or engaging with someone else's culture without explicit permission. And inherently, I don't think there's anything wrong with, with that. I mean, there, there can't be anything wrong with that, right? It's, it's like a, um, a Chinese person in China eating a croissant. Is that cultural appropriation? Yeah. You know, there's, she did, that person probably didn't ask a French person if it's okay to eat a croissant. Is it bad? Absolutely not, you know. Um, but then you take it to um, examples where people do get mad, you know. It's a, it's a Caucasian American wearing a cheap pal. And for some reason, that gets people a lot more upset because of a lot of other conflating frustrations that people find hard to articulate. Um, and then they get mad at this one little example. But I think on the very far left, you see cultural appropriation defined as, um, sort of borrowing from another culture with express purpose to demean um, or to demoralize or to characterize um, a different culture relating to how power balances work, um, specifically within America. And then on the far right side, you see people saying cultural appropriation um, has been taken too far and it just means anytime you participate in another culture um, and that definition, there's, there's things wrong with that definition as well. Yeah, it seems like the the way I have seen it online more often is that there has to be like a uh, a power imbalance between mm -hmm. the appropriator and the culture being appropriated. So yeah. the Chinese person eating a uh, French pastry <laughs> because France is a you know historically stronger culture or stronger nation, then yeah. that cannot be cultural appropriation. And an African American, you know, wearing like a, I don't know, uh, whatever I say will get me in trouble. <laughs> Wearing something stereotypically uh, Caucasian, then you know the, you yeah. can't say that's appropriation. I think, it, but then I know it gets really complicated when you see, and this happens a lot, Asian American communities and Black American communities when they appropriate from one another. It's like, hold on, I have to move around so the light doesn't turn off. Oh, okay. So when you have an Asian American. Um, Asian Americans and black Americans, when they appropriate from one another, there isn't a very clear power 
imbalance there. If anything, you know, these are two marginalized communities within the United States. Um, the, it's uncomfortable to talk about, you know, Asian Americans being, you know, more privileged than black Americans. And I think many, many cases that's true. But like, can you borrow from one another? Is it just as, is it thoughtful? Is, is it more thoughtful or a more unthoughtful? Is it more fair or more unfair to do something like that? It's, it's, I think that, that the power dynamic thing justifies a lot of bad cultural swapping, in my opinion. Um, and then, I don't know, it's just like thinking about the world in terms of these like very small nuances of power asks people to understand it, maybe sometimes an archaic history that doesn't, isn't appropriate anymore. Um, I think one of the main examples that people throw out all the time, they're like, well, Scotland has a really horrible um, history of being invaded and, you know, uh, of war and, you know, rape and pillaging and stuff. And yet people were plaid. Is that cultural appropriation? I was like, well, yeah, it is cultural appropriation, but is it bad? No, I don't think so. Okay, so I think that you're raising a good distinction between saying that you can just, uh, like, matter-of-factly label something cultural appropriation, and that doesn't mean you know, forbidden, you are a bad person, go like, no, with no. yourself 50 times. Yeah. Um, did you, did you see the, um, the backlash that Nicki Minaj was catching for her performance on yeah. SNL? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So she's, um, <laughs> well, you can go ahead and explain it if, if you want. Yeah. I think that a lot of Asian Americans were very eye rolly about the the performance and not just the performance but how she chose to you know package and sort of market her Chung Lee single um I think that the it's this is one of those classic examples between the sort of tension between the black and Asian communities in America um and historically hip-hop is so borrowed from um these Asian American pop culture moments um you know, kung fu movies. Um, there's been a lot of like uh, video game and stuff like that. Um, and anime uh, is a big one too. Well, Chun Li is are... a character from Street Fighter, right? Chun Li is a character from Street Fighter. That's right. But you know, these are still pop culture products, and they're not people. Right. Um, and I think we wrote a. I, I edited another story as part of the APAHM uh, package about the sort of tension between the black and Asian communities. Why people are upset about Nicki Minaj is that she says she's she is interested and excited about Chung Li, um, and the reason she gives is that what her great grandfather I think is Japanese, um, but that also reveals that she has a fundamental misunderstanding of what Chun Li is, um, how to honor a great grandparent who's Japanese. It feels very strange to me that you would choose to honor a Japanese ancestor by you know dressing up like a Chinese you know, video game character who, you know, was designed and created by, you know, Japanese video game uh, programmers, you know. Um, but then in her performance, I think she had like the, the Vietnamese coolie hat. Um, she, she said, I think one of her lyrics was like something, something ding dong, which is like doesn't even make any sense, you know. She's dressed in an outfit that might vaguely resemble the Chung Li character, but it it, 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 there's a lot of like weird Japanese elements to it. Um, and I think in the past that she's been called out for just m confusing what being Asian is. And she takes like Thai references and Chinese references and like Japanese references. And she creates this sort of like medley of a random culture that does not exist. And so I'm totally about, like, I love Chung Li. That was the character I always used to play in when I did Street <laughs> Fire. And it, you know, if she really was a Chung Li fan. She would have done a great homage to it. And yet she just, show that maybe she Googled Chung Li as an image or she really wanted to wear that hairstyle. And she was like, well, no, <laughs> this is my justification, this one random reference. And I think that's one of the main reasons why Asian Americans get really upset about this sort of like very visual cultural appropriation is because our cultures have gotten flattened into this one homogenous Asian American sort of categorization when, you know, we come from over 40 countries. We don't speak the same language. We have we don't share the same history, but the assumptions that non-Asian Americans have about us are that we behave in much the same way. And so that there's a like real true frustration about, you know, being tokenized in this kind of way and sort of um, misunderstood in this kind of way. And then also the fact that people really like, seem to like the, our cultural products, but don't really seem to pay attention to the, the, the real issues surrounding our communities 
mainly being like immigration for one. Um, I think that um, a lot of Asian um, immigrants have, you know, some of the, the, the so are some of the most most poor people in the United States, except for the model minority myth is so persistent that we choose to ignore these huge swaths of people. So those are two things that make make it so Asian Americans can really get upset about this very superficial form of, you know, uh, cultural swapping. It's because these two things don't exist already. And so it's a misdirected anger um, towards something that is actually, I think, meaningless. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a pop song and a performance on SNL and or it's a 17-year-old uh, prom dress yeah. that somehow you know, <laughs> these things are, like, distracting and yet they can, and it's pretty meaningless, and, but they can, mm. you know, piss people off in crazy ways. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. What you said is really interesting. Um, you know, uh, the, 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 just a side note on that performance, the backup dancers mm-hmm. were dressed like uh, Sub-Zero from Mortal Kombat, who was my favorite character to play. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That back in the day, so it was it was both a it was you know a Sega versus uh, SNES um, mashup as well. But so yeah. so I, I yeah I hear you about kind of the how it's when your cult when your culture gets kind of mashed up with someone with a, the culture of uh, from a different nation of origin mm-hmm. that's offensive if people just see it as as um, you know all the same thing and just all one like play bo- like sandbox they can play in. Um, but yeah. at, at the same time, there is something almost like, in a way, like beautifully American about a like black female rapper who's a who takes like six different cultures and like creates her own like fantasia of them and mm-hmm. and combines them because I think what one of the good things about America is like cultural mixing and um, cultural exchange and you know there's the fact oh, yeah. that we've appropriated pizza and hot dogs and hamburgers and that. Um, a, a Jewish songwriter wrote White Christmas and Easter Parade and you know, these are like yeah. good things about America and they don't happen in, in other countries. That's so true. I mean, it, we are so lucky to live in a country where our neighbors don't look like us, you know, and no matter which direction you turn, our neighbors don't look like us. Um, and I think that that's a really wonderful thing. But I think that the difference between a Nicki Minaj, Chung Lee song and the other references that you have is that it was not a good song. It was... <laughs> I you know, agree. it was not well executed and it wasn't clever or smart or said anything new. She didn't bring anything new to the table. Like she has every right to do whatever she wants with her art. Um, but I think that people can have, also have every right to criticize her for not turning out something good. I would say that American pizza is in many ways better than an Italian style pizza. Like those are two different food groups, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but, you know, when you're when you're going to be remixing or doing something new or novel with it, it you should make sure that whatever you're doing is good. You know, like what we don't need another like run in the will mill, like white, like uh, watered down ramen shop on the corner. <laughs> like what we like, I don't care if the person who's creating the ramen um, or cooking the ramen is, you know, trained in Japan or a Japanese origin, but they better do a good job with whatever they're making. If it's just like a crappy ramen, like then, then they're opened up themselves up to criticism in a way that they wouldn't if they made a good product. Mm-hmm. Um, do you, do you think that, I mean, is it more than just a coincidence that kind of the rise in the cultural appropriation charge has coincided with the rise of social media? Um, uh, no, I don't think it's a surprise at all. You know, what social media does is it really rewards, um, very strong opinions that are very, also very decisive and sort of general, um, and it's a, it's a feedback mechanism that is instant, it's it lasts a long time. It's pervasive, and people get addicted to it. You know, and call out culture is um, exists because it's so easy to participate in it. It's so easy to feel like you've accomplished something when you know the likes start rolling in, the conversations start happening because you're like, oh, I thought something. I like, I like showed someone. I stuck it to them. <laughs> um, but then at the end of the day, what did you do other than raise awareness? And I think social media is excellent at getting people to to know that a conversation is happening and get to, 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 you know, get people to understand that a thing is going on in this world. What it's not so good at is to get people to understand, you know, the nuances behind it or the, to actually understand why it's happening, how it's happening, um, and why it's important or not important. But yeah, social media is, is where all these conversations are happening. I can say pretty confidently that like, I have never had one of these conversations in real life. <laughs> I can pretty confidently say that I've never had one of these conversations in real life 
that has felt so inflammatory and sort of disrespectful and dismissive as the ones I see happening in social media. Um, yeah. You know, and that's not to say that in real life these conversations are not don't feel edgy and offensive sometimes and uncomfortable. Like they're where they they're way more uncomfortable to have. Um, but in real life, it's much harder to to be mean to someone's face, you know, and to, oh, yeah, to for shout sure. ignorance to someone's face um, and be like okay with sounding ignorant and mean and dumb when another person actually has something, you know, something to say in response. So. Yeah, social media has created a really strange <laughs> way that we engage in rhetoric and talk with one another. Yeah, I think it also creates kind of an, uh, an opportunity for like moral preening and like showing mm -hmm. how great you are. And if you're adding in uh, dumping, being the 10,000th person who's dumping on the 17 year old who wore a, um, uh, a Chongsam, um, then, yeah. you know, you, you feel good about yourself and, and you get pats on the back from your fellow like tribe members and yeah. exactly and then you can mute the other people that you don't like to listen to and that anonymous 17 year old you never get a chance to you know talk to her and see like oh i too was a 17 year old at one point you know it's i just feel like teens should be teens, <laughs> teens yeah yeah that, 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 that whole like, episode is gross and the fact that it like ended yeah. up in the new york times is, is pretty bizarre um, well i mean that was another thing i wanted to say the the new york times has a tendency to always be like well this is a huge thing that's happening within this very specific american community let's go talk to chinese people in china about what they think about that hmm. you know and which is just the, the strangest the strangest thing to me because like chinese people in china like they don't they've never experienced this cultural flattening that Ch chinese americans have number two it's like they have never interacted with an American in a way where they see that, you know, they're, people are interested in being friends with them or creating up job opportunities for them or advocating for them in terms of immigration or, um, you know, or, or rights, but they're very interested in eating their foods or, you know, wearing their, like wearing their trends. You know, they they don't, there's never that weird disconnect between the people that, you know, um, like your, like your stuff, but don't like you. So it's strange to ask people in China about this when they have no context. Mm -hmm. um, so you just mentioned two things, eating food and wearing clothes. Yeah. And I was thinking a lot of these battles have played out in fashion and food. I don't mm -hmm. quite understand why. Um, do you have any <laughs> theories about that? Um, I think it's because these are two very lucrative industries. Um, there's a lot of money to be made in both fashion and food, and there are two industries, too, that are mainly meant to be for entertainment, you know? It's like a, something fun um, uh, that you participate in. So I think that the the, the exploitation factor um, of cultural appropriation is a lot more salient in, in food and fashion. It's like when you're selling a T-shirt that has, I don't know, a, a, that that... that takes a cultural product and you're, you're making money off of it, it's very easy to draw the connection and be like, well, you did this, you didn't get permission, it's wrong. And then when it comes to um, actual laws, like we have laws that, that are in place that um, prevent, you know, businesses and owner uh, uh, places from, you know, appropriating these like very marginalized cultures um, and creating products that are inspired by, like, for instance, there are all these um, rules that um, protect Native Americans and their arts and handcrafts. They're the only ones who are able to sell these things. And so when you have Urban Outfitters creating, like, these war bonnets or saying something as Cherokee, like a Cherokee print, that's actually illegal. Um, mm. And I think that that doesn't really happen outside of, of fashion. Um, Maybe that maybe that's why. But you'll see this in Hollywood too. The representation um, sort of uh, dialogue that's happening in Hollywood about you know how there are not enough Asian Americans in um, in movies, or they have a white person uh, playing an Asian character, or they you know set an entire you know movie in in Asia and there's not a single like Asian character in it. Like that happens a lot. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also important to remember that all of these conversations, food, fashion movies, it's a conversation that's happening in the upper middle class. You know, this is this is mostly for very, very privileged, very, very elite people. And if you ask, you know, those who are not so active on social media because they don't have time or they just really don't care to be <laughs> participating in these sorts of things, like this yeah. isn't really an issue that they're focused on because it seems so superficial. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I, I find I find the distinctions weird. I mean, like if I were to like read a novel by an Asian author that you know translated into mm-hmm. English, like I don't think the, the, like no one would ever think that was cultural appropriation. But I'm like spending a lot more time yeah. involved in that world than I am if yeah. I were like a T-shirt that has you know Chinese characters on it or or something. So I, yeah. yeah, I think I think there's some illogic in what what aggravates people or, or sets them off. Yeah, yeah. I just think that if people actually take the time to understand why that they're frustrated about something or why they feel so entitled to to showcase how ignorant they are through their fashion or their food choices or something, like they might, you know, really understand um, what's actually going on. Because I think one of the biggest comments that I've gotten um, that sort of challenged this article is that, you know, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Why shouldn't I have the right to wear whatever I want, eat whatever I want? I'm like, you do. Like, this is this is one of the best parts about living in America. You have the right to do anything with, when it comes to your consumerism, you know? Right. You can do whatever you want to. But what what happens is that, like, more often than not, whenever I engage with a person who seems like they are interested in a small part of my culture... The, the shallowness of their interest was, is really astounding. Like the, oftentimes I'll be told a really, really boring and mildly racist story about a trip they took to to Chinatown, you know, or they'll be like, "Oh, I really love sushi," or you know, <laughs> anime is my favorite. Like I lo- watch a lot of anime on Netflix, and I'm like, "Well, okay, well, what what could have been an interesting sort of dialogue just became really like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna engage anymore. It doesn't make me feel flattered at all. It makes me feel like totally misunderstood. So yeah, yes, imitation might be a very a sincere form of flattery, um, but oftentimes it's just sincerely stupid. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that makes sense. And I think any uh, racial or ethnic minority group can fall prey to that kind of thing of someone saying like. You know, I mean, it, it was the joke in Get Out where the dad was saying, I would have voted for Obama a third time. And, yeah. you know, <laughs> you, you can, someone saying to me, oh, why, I have a, well, one of my best friends is Jewish. You know, that, that kind yeah, of yeah. thing can happen. Definitely. And that's, you know, we live in, <laughs> we live in a diverse society. Um, yeah. I'd love to give people the benefit of the doubt, but, you know, people need to, to step it up a little bit, I think. <laughs> um, there was a, an article a couple of years ago, I think it, it may have been by Robbie Suave at the uh, at Reason, who uh-huh. d- made a distinction between cultural appropriation and cultural mockery, uh-huh. um, saying appropriation, there's nothing wrong with appropriation, but it's cultural mockery that we should uh-huh. object to. So, you know, um, uh, blackface uh, oh, yeah. in the news uh, because of uh, this uh, Drake uh, versus Pusha T uh, Yep. Battle. Um, and, mm-hmm. you know, wearing like a sombrero on Cinco de Mayo and getting drunk at a bar, like uh-huh. these are not like actual <laughs> like moments of taking imbibing culture. They're just using cultural symbols as like a joke or a, a means of fun. Yeah, I think that it, it gets complicated because there's so many festivals where positivity and sort of like a like positivity is at its core. I'm thinking about things like Coachella or Burning Man, but you're still choosing a costume to dress up as and like, you know, uh, putting on a sort of persona and dressing up as a thing that you normally wouldn't see in your, in your nine to five. Um, And wearing costume essentially to go to one of these, these festivals or gatherings that are supposed to promote positivity. Um, I've had a lot of burners come up to me being like, well, I really wanted to wear, you know, like a Indian, um, you know, Indian jewelry and a sari to this thing. Is that cultural appropriation? I was like, I don't know. Like, are you comfortable wearing it because there's no Indians at, <laughs> at Burning Man? And they're like, well, maybe. And I'm like, well, maybe that's something to think about, you know. It's still a costume that you're putting on. I don't think the express purpose of, a, of someone at Coachella wearing like a um, like a bindi, for instance, like they're, I don't think they, they're wearing it because they think it's beautiful, but they're still putting it on as a costume. And in, in that way, it minimizes the culture in a, in a pretty like gross way, I think. Uh, but I don't know if they're doing it just to demean or demoralize or um, uh, mock another culture. Yeah. It's complicated, and, right? <laughs> yeah, it is complicated. And, and Halloween is like another like flashpoint for these things. And mm-hmm. there was this big blow up at Yale a couple years ago over Halloween costumes and like an email yeah. that the administration sent out about appropriate costumes. And then like an assistant dean or something uh, sent out an email saying, that you know, let the kids wear whatever they want. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, where, where do you have any thoughts on Halloween as a uh, I mean, flashpoint? Well, I, 
I personally love Halloween. I think Halloween is a, an amazing opportunity to just make a great visual joke over and over and over, every, like during one night. I think you should wear whatever you want to wear, but you should also be prepared to, you know, engage in some tough conversations. If you have a tough costume, you mm -hmm. know, that's that's uh, that's what you see. I think that a lot of people back in the day before cell phones, before um, you know, digital cameras and social media, you wear your Halloween costume, you go to a house party, you're surrounded by people who look and think like you, and then you go home. Of course, no one's going to call you out for something like that, you know? But now it's like, you're not just going to one party, you're not just going out to a street, you're wearing your costume essentially for the entire world to see if there are cameras there, if there are social media going on. You have to reframe, you know, the, the, the community of people that you're dressing up for. Um, so uh, Halloween's a weird one, but again, like I think you should wear whatever you want to. Just be prepared to have that dialogue. I'm not going to ever say that I'm like a, I'm going to wear a sports jersey and then feel confident going into a bar thinking that, oh, this is just a fashion statement because I know people are going to want to talk to me about like whatever team I have in the back or whoever's number or name is on it. And mm -hmm. if I'm not prepared to have that conversation, I look like an idiot. So I think that... <laughs> That's the same thing if people want to wear this, a cultural product and they can't talk about it. It's like you, you just end up looking kind of stupid. Mm -hmm. Not offensive, just stupid. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about the Met Ball, Met Gala um, yeah. for a minute, uh, which, was, which is getting roped into the cultural appropriation um, mm -hmm. conversation. Uh, so for people who don't pay any attention to this stuff, can you describe what this event is? Yeah, so every single year, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York um, collaborates with, uh, well, actually, they have a gallery inside of the museum called the Costume Institute. Um, and every year, they pick one sort of very dramatic theme, um, and they invite a lot of contemporary designers to lend their pieces to sort of execute and talk about whatever theme this is. This year, it was about Catholicism, sort of the, the, the glory, the aesthetic glory inherited in, in Catholicism, and this idea that if you practice Catholicism, you have this thing called the Catholic imagination, which which asks you to dream beyond the sort of like worldly mundanity that we're surrounded by and to think in grand grand terms. Um, that is a separate thing. It collaborates with Vogue on this party um, that is 90% a red carpet and then 10%, I think, like a performance inside and then very famous and rich people get to mingle with one another and everybody leaves. Um, it's funny because there's a theme attached to it. So in one sense, it's like the, mo the, the, the dialed up 10 out of 10 level of a costume party. It's like it's Halloween, but in May. Um, and it's really hard to connect this like cerebral topic that, you know, took a team of people an entire year to sort of try to execute delicately to turn it into a red carpet moment. And sometimes it's really unfair, I think, what they're doing to these celebrities. They're like, can you come up with like a, a gown moment, you know, that's, you know, a, your, a custom made sort of gown that asks you to like reconcile Catholicism with, um, you know, your, your own beliefs. And also like, there's gonna be like priests and stuff there. So you don't wanna be too offensive, but you know, <laughs> it's an impossible ask for these celebrities who don't think about these things, you know? Um, and so this year, People just take the, you know, the silliest elements. They're like, what could I do without sort of, like, causing a scene? Um, Rihanna took it probably very far with her, uh, I forget what it's called, a meter, like a yeah, yeah. meter. Um, and I think Lena Waithe did a really powerful thing, where she wore a cape that was like a rainbow cape as sort of like a protest um, against, um, you know, how, uh, you know, gay citizens have been treated by the Catholic Church. Um you know, but I don't think a lot of people interpreted it any further than just like putting a crown on their head. Um, very left people, not very left people, a lot of people on the left, the, the way they were talking about it was like, well, the two tenets of cultural appropriation, there's no power imbalance here. And they asked in, like, they asked the Catholic Church and they participated willingly. Like, thus, it's not cultural appropriation. I some still like it. It's, it is cultural appropriation, <laughs> but is it bad? It depends on what perspective you're looking at. You know, I think that Catholicism has always been something that people have rebelled against. And that's, that's been its own source of art and culture. Like, I would say punk probably came, came around because in many sense it was an opposition to sort of like, you know, this sort of like very religious, narrow-minded, um, 
traditional way of, of living and being and maybe punk grew out of this, Madonna grew out of this, some of the best cultural products we have grew out of this opposition to caste Catholicism. Um, so you can do whatever you want, just make sure it's good. Punk is good, Madonna was good. <laughs> Rihanna's outfit was really good. Yeah, I, as someone who knows nothing about fashion, I thought the, the women's yeah. outfits were good. There was an interesting piece, I think it was in Vox, that said, um, made the case that the celebrity fashion didn't go far enough in being weird because there's weird fashion oh, yeah. in the Catholic church, especially uh, the men's fashion. You know, I think maybe one or two of the famous men who were there were wearing like gown type um, yeah. things, but you know, a, a Catholic uh, priest wearing full vestments That's true. is I mean, wearing something very different than, than like a tuxedo that a man wears this kind of event. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, the other unspoken thing, if you're a celebrity walking on a red carpet, you can't look that ridiculous. You know, you still have to look attractive and marketable. And so that's another hard thing. Um, I think that the Catholic thing really pushed a lot of buttons in, I think, a healthy way. But there have been moments in, where it's been just like, just asking for like controversy. They did um, an exhibit, I think two years or three years ago now, um, about Orientalism. It wasn't called Orientalism, but that was essentially what it is, how Western designers have been inspired by their idea of what the East was. Mm -hmm. And the exhibit did a really interesting job of, you know, seeing these areas that um, that Westerners had created these categorizations of what the East was, and then talking about how that's not how East, like anyone in the East interpreted things. They're like this one style of pottery was such an inspiration for Western designers and people in China were like, what? <laughs> You know, but then asking people to dress up in Orientalism for a red carpet was just so <laughs> wild to me. I was like, oh, my God, if you're going to really do this theme justice, like what, do you, like, what does that mean? You have to go find, like, a Caucasian designer, you know, from the West and ask them to, to make a Chinese-inspired or a Japanese-inspired or Korean-inspired thing. And what is that? That's just, like, it's an impossible scenario, and I felt really bad for I felt really bad for the celebrities. <laughs> well, we, they, they, they still are rich and famous, so we shouldn't feel <laughs> that bad for them. Um, yeah. Maybe um, I have one more question. So you talked about like yeah. uh, like asking permission, uh, you mm -hmm. know, if you're a white person and you want to do something um, that might be cultural appropriation, can you ask permission in your article? You talk about a woman who uh, wants to wear a Chinese style, buy a Chinese style dress uh, while mm -hmm. she's visiting China and she talks to you about whether it's okay or not. I, I, I feel like this mm -hmm. is weird because... Um, you know, no, it's obvious that no one person can speak for a culture and, um, it's like, well, my friend over here said it was okay, but I didn't ask this friend who maybe thought it wasn't okay. So uh -huh. I, I, I don't know the, 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 besides like the social media mob, like, I don't know what the arbiter of this is okay. This isn't okay. And who can grant like forgiveness or absolution or permission and, and like, how, yeah. many, how many people do you have to go to find like a jury of a dozen? Like, I, I, it just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. But I think that if you do a little research about the thing that you're, you want to wear or consume, um, the answer might be more clear to you after you understand, you know, what you're actually participating in. And sometimes you that means not asking your friend, you know, sometimes it just means like, okay, well maybe this isn't something I want to engage with, or this is actually something that feels fine. And then it's the idea of maybe you should you should have more than one friend of a certain ethnic group is, is another thing that I'm finding. It's like a lot of these people are like, but like my, my one Asian friend said it was fine. Like, well, do you have a second one? Do you have a third one? Maybe you can ask around a little bit. Like, uh -huh. And if you don't have one, that's something to think about, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm more talking about like a specific occasion where there is a, a dress code, for instance, or, you know, someone has invited you to participate in a thing. And I'm thinking more along the lines of like, like, if you're invited to an Indian wedding, you know, is it okay to wear an Indian garment to an Indian wedding? Of course, if it's in the dress code, yeah, you definitely should. But I think that a lot of people just take that as like a blanket sort of like, okay, I'm going to do it. And I'm and like, and they don't really research it. And I've seen so many occasions of like, very misguided, you know, Westerners who show up to an Indian wear wedding wearing the Indian bridal gown. And you're just like, no, no. Oh, my God. Like, that's, you look like the bride. And I understand the bride's not wearing white, but you should know that, you know. 
or it's like a win- uh, uh, a wedding that's um, between two northern Indian families, you know, and then they show up wearing like a southern Indian outfit, and it's like, is that okay? Like, of course it's fine, but like, you know, the aunties are going to be looking at you like, <laughs> who is this? <laughs> who are they? You know, so it's it's more more of that. Like, if you have a question, ask someone who would know, um, especially if they, they're these things are so specific and that's the kind of permission I think that is the only necessary permission that you should probably get um, and it's mostly just an etiquette saving face thing you just don't want to look like a you know insensitive um, when sensitivity is paramount also when you travel too um, I think a lot of people think that traveling is is for themselves which I think that is also that's right but traveling is also trying to not to make a ruckus in the place that you're going to And, you know, clothing has so much to do with that. You know, you should know about the customs and the dress codes of the places you're going to, you know, not just like taking it as an opportunity to like, you know, I'm I'm in Tokyo, I'm going to wear a kimono today. It's like, yeah, you like you sure you can totally do that. But, you know, it's more important to not like, you know, maybe there's a cleavage issue going on or maybe people don't wear like pants above a a, a certain length. There's modesty, modesty concerns. Mm -hmm. Um, It's. They're considered very offensive to wear, you know, kimono in um, China, for instance, you know, and that might be not be something that people would know if they didn't look into it. Um, and that's, if that's again, that's not direct permission. Like, no, you, you shouldn't be asking someone for blanket permission to go talk to another group of people. Um, but it's more or less like a gut check. Yeah. Like, you should ask for gut check. <clears throat> not permission. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, do you have anything else you, oh, you want to say before we wrap up? Well, I- yeah, well, the permission thing, I think, is more applicable to when you're going to make money off of a thing, you know? So if you're going to create an Etsy shop that is, you know, you're taking an art form or whatever from one specific designer or one specific group or ethnic group or something, like, mm-hmm. you should, you know, think about, you know, whether your product means someone else won't be buying their product, you know? And that's the kind of permission that you should need. Sometimes it's a legal thing, as in the case with a lot of Native groups. Um, but that's that's the permission and sort of like referencing and checking that I think people need to do more of. Yeah. And I guess that reminds me of, I guess the kind of big hobby horse I have about the whole cultural appropriation topic is like, you know, culture is not a a finite um, substance that you're stealing, you're stealing someone's uh, food or money or something. So it's a renewable resource and people create it all the time. Um, So if I, you know, so the way you mentioned, you described it, if I'm at an Etsy store where I'm using like someone else's cultural uh, symbols Mm -hmm. uh, that don't belong to my group, then, you know, they're not buying someone else's more legitimate objects or whatever. But um, yeah, it just, you know, I don't appropriating, you know, like, the you know like the government appropriates land and then they they, mm-hmm. they have it and it doesn't belong to you anymore uh yeah. you know if i culturally appropriate it still still belongs to to the the native culture yeah i mean I, there are so many instances where um artists create really really beautiful representations of a culture that is not their own and that's there's nothing really wrong with that i just think that 99 percent of that those products are just bad you know, and it's just like, well, the, the, the hubris of that, of that, you know, oftentimes white artist to think that they can do it better than someone else is just like, that's the thing that people get ticked off with. They're just like, oh, of course. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, why don't we end it there? So, um, Connie, if people are interested in finding out more about your work, where can they look? Yeah, they can go to refinery29.com. Um, my author page is in my Twitter bio, which is at Connie Wang. You should read it. <laughs> um, so thank you again for coming on. Um, uh, this was an interesting conversation. I learned a lot. Um, thanks to all of our listeners and viewers out there. Uh, you know, all of you can subscribe to this show in iTunes, or uh, you can also subscribe, subscribe to Blogging Heads TV or Meaning of Life TV on YouTube. Um, so Connie, thanks again. Thanks for having me, Arya.